to see an actual doctor. He's a PhD. He's worked on too many projects for me to name, so I'm just going to let him tell you. You're in for one heck of a red pill treat. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Martin. Thank you. Well, I had the good fortune yesterday of giving the opening address at the Weston Price Conference in Dallas, Texas. And for those of you who did not get a chance to see that, I have the good fortune of letting you know that they were kind enough to break their lifelong policy and take that video and put it outside the paywall. First time they've done it, uh, so my speech yesterday is actually now available on Rumble and a bunch of other places. So just take a look at Weston Price and my name and you'll find that, that video. And I'm super grateful that they did that because um, they decided after I got down off the stage that it was such an important speech that it had to be available to everybody. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> I said there that that was my second to last speech, which means this one is my last one. Um, and let me clarify what I mean by that. You'll hear a lot of me um, from now on, but you're going to hear a different version of me. I'm done with Mr. Nice Guy. Um, so for those of you who are out there kind of going, oh, he's such a nice person. Behind that bow tie, I'm sure there's a sweet, docile person. Well, this is your last day of this. Um, because let me make something abundantly clear. We're living in a country and in a world right now that has decided that a technology is worth murdering five-year-olds. I find that unacceptable. Let me say that one more time. I find that unacceptable. And I find it unacceptable that in a world where we're killing five-year-olds, we don't think that's the problem we should stop right now. I don't care about every other problem we've got, and we have a lot of them. But I'm going to tell you what, when I put my pet head on my pillow at night, and I know that I haven't done everything that is within my power to actually save the lives of children, that I haven't done what I'm here to do. So, newsflash, from now on, I'm not a drive-by shooting one of 50 speakers on a stage. I will speak where we, the people, decide that it is time this country does not allow any organization, any institution, any financial interest ever, ever in the future to kill five-year-olds in the name of science, or in the name of policy, or in the name of anything else. I am done being Mr. Nice Guy. There you go. Just so you know, I'm really here because I'm keeping Ed Griffin's promise. Now, here's the funny thing. You haven't heard this, so I'm going to tell you. I got a funny call from Ed. He goes, um, I think I made a mistake. I made a promise that I think only you can keep. Because apparently what he said was he was going to have this Red Pill Expo in Louisiana. And at this expo, he was going to actually have somebody who was willing to put the names and faces of the people who actually are running this entire theater of terror on a slide. Not hide behind the, you know, it's the conspiracy cabal and it's the this and that. I mean their names, their faces, and their addresses. Because here's the tiny little problem. We actually, listen carefully, we energize the forces of darkness when we anonymize them. Let me say that one more time. We energize the forces of darkness when we anonymize them. And when we see their faces on a screen, we realize that they are merely individuals who have lost the social contract with humanity that says that we, the people, are entitled to life, liberty, and happiness. The problem is we give them energy by keeping them in the dark. So guess what's happening today? To fulfill the promise that I made to Ed Griffin, there is a slide in this presentation, which is the they. I was advised by many people that I shouldn't do this because it paints a target on me. Guess what? Guess what? This bow tie has magic powers. It has magic powers. It's been giving me powers ever since I was a little boy. And if you go on my Facebook page, you can see the magic powers. But I'll tell you something else. And this is courtesy of my beautiful wife, Kim. And Kim's here. Stand up, Kim. Because Kim is absolutely 
not the wing, you know, not some sort of Bette Midler, the wind beneath my wings nonsense. Kim, Kim, Kim is actually a person who stands right beside me. And I'll tell you what, sometimes when the going gets a little tough, she goes, I'm not sure you should do that. But all the time, all the time, after she goes through all the things that are natural and appropriate and responsible, she says, and we're going to do the right thing. Because we are going to do the right thing. And because of that commitment, I honor her because she's not standing behind me, beside me, but we are standing together for the future of humanity. And the beautiful thing is, and I want to give tribute to where tribute is due. A couple of weeks ago in Yuba City, California, a lot of people saw this speech. We were surrounded by the most loving, beautiful people who shielded us with the most elaborate prayers, the most amazing energy. And Kim's comment afterward was a very simple one. She said, you know what? They never factored this in. The forces of darkness never factored in. The power of 25 people who hold nothing but love and light. Nothing but love and light. So guess what? There's no force that can take me. And they cannot take me and they cannot take my life. You know why? Because this is not my life. It's not mine to give. This was given to me. I'm a steward of this thing that I walk around in. And when it's used by date is up. Guess what? It's old milk. Throw it out. But between now and then, I'm standing for the future of this country. And I'm standing for the future of humanity. And I'm going to keep standing until my use-by date. So let's get it really clear. This isn't courage. This is actually what each and every one of us has to do, which is when we are informed and we are capable of knowing the truth, it is incumbent on us to share that as far and as wide and as confidently as possible. So this is your moment of boldness, people. I'm going to give you the slide to share with the world. You're going to get the people that Ed Griffin said need to be outed. Well, they're going to be outed. Hey, before I go into the speech, I can't do a speech without pointing this out. Everybody calls me a conspiracy theorist. I'm not. I actually have done investigations into conspiracies for the last 30 years of my life. They're criminal conspiracies. And for those of you missing the point, a criminal conspiracy is defined by two or more people getting together to plan an illegal act. The slide behind me is the living proof that this was not a theory. This is a criminal conspiracy of domestic terror. And let's read so that we get this into the record what exactly they said. Until an infectious disease crisis is very real, present, and at an emergency threshold, it is often largely ignored. To sustain funding... Anybody? To sustain funding, not for public health, not for your health and well-being. To sustain funding beyond the current crisis, we need to increase the public understanding of the need for medical countermeasures such as a pan-influenza and a pan-coronavirus vaccine. Ladies and gentlemen, this statement was made by Peter Daszak in 2015. And in 2008, the World Health Organization said coronavirus was eradicated. Why in 2015 would at a National Academy of Sciences meeting, they say that we need the world to accept a pan-coronavirus vaccine for a thing that didn't exist? Why would you do that? Because you're a criminal conspirator is why. That's why you do it. And it turns out it gets worse. A key driver is the media, and the economics will follow the hype. We need to use that hype to our advantage to get to the real issues investors will follow if they see profit at the end of the process. That's a quote. That statement was made in 2015 at the National Academy of Sciences meeting, and it was so egregious that they decided to publish it in February of 2016 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Ladies and gentlemen, that's admission of a felony. And the felony is domestic terrorism. Now, I'm going to give you a little more meat on this, but those of you who like to celebrate a particular endowed with hair, former president, I got a problem. And this is the problem. On September 18th, 2019, there was a statement made by the World Health Organization that by September 2020, we were going to have a, quote, accidental or voluntary release of a respiratory pathogen and a global simulation so that we could actually get the world to accept a universal vaccine platform. 
That was published on September 18th, 2019. On September 19th, 2019, President Trump signed this executive order. And I want you to read what I highlighted in red. This vaccine platform will include technologies like DNA, messenger RNA, mRNA, virus-like S particles, vector-based and self-assembling nanoparticles. That was an executive order President Trump signed on the 19th of September, 2019. Do you see the executive order that President Trump signed the day after Anthony Fauci, the Chinese CDC, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in an illegal criminal conspiracy said that we were going to build a universal pan-coronavirus vaccine. The next day, the president signed that executive order. Now, I don't know how many hamburgers he ate that night, but I'm going to tell you what. My guess is he didn't write that. Anybody want to go out on a limb with me on that one? My guess is that every piece of language in that document is something that did not come out of a Big Mac wrapper. He didn't open it up going, hmm, cheeseburger and coronavirus vaccine nanoparticles. But the point is, that doesn't exonerate a failure in leadership. If you as a leader put your signature to the death sentence to Americans, you know what you've done? You've signed the death sentence of Americans. That's what you've done. Let's call it what it is. That is a criminal conspiracy, and the criminal conspiracy must be held to account. Now, I am going to give you a very quick timeline to help you understand how I do what I do. Let's start back in 1990, and you heard what I said correctly. 1990, Pfizer filed the first coronavirus vaccine patent on canine coronavirus vaccine. 1990, and you know what that vaccine was? The S1 spike protein. Has anybody heard of the S1 spike protein before? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Yes, that is a bioweapon. And it turns out that it's a protein sequence derived from the model of coronavirus. And it is a bioweapon. It is not a pathogen. It's a weapon. And we need to start using the correct language because you know what a parent won't do? If we actually tell them that their kids are getting injected with a weapon, we would have less parents injecting their children. If you keep using the language of vaccine, you run the risk of losing every argument. But if you start calling it what it is, a bioweapon, known to be a bioweapon. And for those of you who missed this point, I haven't done this before, but I'm going to do it just because I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated when people go, oh, you're using these languages and you're kind of being technically incorrect. So for all the fact checkers at Reuters who actually can't read and all the fact checkers at Snopes and fact checkers at Fact Check and fact checkers at USA Today. I'm going to read what a bioweapon is from our own. Let's see what this is. 18 U.S. Code Section 175. And by the way, the penalty for doing this, life in prison. And he up for life in prison for these guys. I'm happy for that. 18 U.S. Code Section 175. Whoever knowingly develops, produces, stockpiles, transfers, acquires, retains, or possesses any biologic agent, toxin, or delivery system for use as a weapon, or, or, and this is a key part, people, listen to the words of the statute, or knowingly assists a foreign state or any organization to do so, or attempts, threatens, or conspires to do the same, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned for life or both. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what I'm talking about, because the S1 spike protein is a weapon. It's a weapon. And it's not from nature. It's actually amplified because in 1999, Anthony Fauci decided to use that particular protein sequence as a vaccine vector. And he, and I, I wish I could make this one up, but I can't make it up because it happens to just be the truth. He asked Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill to make, and I'm quoting, an infectious replication defective clone. Infectious replication defective. What does that mean? That means amplify the harm to human. That's what that means. You're taking a thing, you're actually making it more lethal, and then in 2002, you're patenting it. Please stop talking about the Chinese virus. There is none. There isn't one. Please stop talking about the virus. There isn't one. There's a bioweapon that was built 
in 1990, perfected in 1999, patented in 2002, and deployed against humanity in 2002, which gave us the first outbreak of SARS. Listen carefully, people. We are failing our argument because we're using the language of the colonial imp imperialists rather than using the truth. And they can lampoon us and they can undermine us every time we open our mouth because we're using the wrong language. We have never tested with any RT-PCR, any coronavirus. We've tested protein fragments. You know why? Because we're looking for the evidence of the bullet. Like we would look at the patterns of the rifling on a bullet in a forensic case. That's what RT-PCR is doing. Stop using the language that keeps us enslaved. Start using the language of the truth, which is this was a weapon and it was built to take out humanity. Now, what happened to my slide? That's a black slide. That's not the, that, that's the slide we want. How many of you are familiar with the company Answer, A-N-S-E-R? I love having this moment. Do you know that they are the single largest contractor in the entire COVID terrorism campaign? Yeah, you do now. And guess what you're responsible for now? The truth. You are responsible for this truth because it turns out that the companies on the right that you think are the ones running this show are in fact the front. Now, you know what a front organization is? They're the ones that are supposed to take the flack and take the heat. The ones on the left are the ones that actually got the money. Operation Warp Speed went to answer. You didn't know that because you were told by the media that it went to Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson Johnson, all that kind of stuff. That's not true. The prime contract of Operation Warp Speed went through answer, a company none of you heard of. And you didn't hear about them because the contract that was signed was signed with ATI, a company based in South Carolina, a company whose history has been government defense contracts for the purpose of propaganda. I wish I made that up. The prime contractor selected to run Operation Warp Speed was a propaganda expert for the U.S. Department of Defense. Now, cunningly, the reason why they were selected is for the following reason. And listen carefully, because this is getting really thick really fast, and I have to deliver it, because i got 28 minutes and 9 seconds left, and i got a long way to go. Here's the problem. The problem is... We have a world in which there's things under the 1986 Act and under the 2005 PREP Act that actually shield manufacturers from liability. But inside of the 1986 Act and inside the 2005 PREP Act, there's a tiny little clause problem, which is if any actions taken to declare a state of emergency are part of a willful misconduct or a cr criminal felony conspiracy, the liability shield gets pierced and the manufacturers of the drugs are liable for every injury and every death. Listen, they're liable for every injury and every death. So why on earth did you think that they ran Operation Warp Speed through a cover company? Think back to Bhopal, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody remember American Cyanamid, any of the, the, the great old companies, that, those wonderful days when we killed hundreds of thousands of people in India? Remember those? Remember those heady days of chemical corporations that would set up holding companies? that actually did the asbestos deals so that when somebody actually got injured and died and got sued, they bankrupt the shell company. That's what answer is. Answer is the way for the federal government never to be liable for the criminal conspiracy they know they ran. They are now one of the top 10 federal contractors in history below Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and all those guys. Those names you know. You don't know answer. The single company that by COVID rose the highest rank rise in the history of federal contracting, the highest single year rise ever was answer. And none of you know who they are. They're the target. And we're not talking about the target. We're actually aiming for the decoys and wondering why no ducks are on the table. I was hoping I could get a second amendment laugh out of that one. You guys are pathetic. Wake up. Let's go. I could have said moose, and I could have at least gotten the Montana people on board. <laughs> Answer Corporation. They're the ones op running Operation Warp Speed, and they've been set up to shield these manufacturers from ever taking the financial liability for their willful 
misconduct. And one day everybody's going to go, let's go sue Pfizer. Let's go sue everybody else. And the only problem is when we go to sue them, they're going to go, hey, it wasn't us. And they're right. And all of us were asleep. And I'm talking to an awoke crowd here. And all of you were asleep. Don't tell me you're awake if you're still sleeping. Because if you didn't know who answer is, you're still asleep. It gets worse. Fours Marsh. Anybody know Fours Marsh? Another empty, crowded room. You know who Fours Marsh is? They're the branding agency that branded COVID. They're the ones that make sure that we find hospitals that are overrun with people. And they're the ones that find kids that die to COVID right before the FDA needs to vote on giving kids injections. They're the ones that go around the world making sure that every message is always the same. We will not return to normal until we have a vaccine. Thank you, Justin Trudeau. Where'd you get the script? From Floors Marsh. And how many of you knew that? None of you. How about Palantir? Hey, that's a weird one, isn't it? Peter Thiel, who has successfully run a company that has lost $200 million plus every year for about seven or eight years, goes public in the middle of COVID. Isn't timing interesting? Isn't it fascinating that a company that's done nothing but lose billions of dollars goes public in the middle of the worst economic cycle we've had? Isn't that funny? And did you actually go back and read their public offering? Ha, huh, funny. I know you didn't because there really wasn't one. That's why you didn't read it. Because they went public in this very bizarre back doorway of actually selling founders' stock into the market. So we got personally enriched, personally enriched, using the public market as the laundering facility. Isn't that brilliant? But let's look at what they did for our COVID scandal. They actually came up with a thing called Gotham Data Tracking. Now, how many of you are familiar with the term Gotham? Anybody? Marvel comic, DC comic crazies out there? Hey, how many times has Gotham been associated with a really positive thing? You know, kind of Garden of Eden, you know, the, the, the wonderful Hanging Garden of Babylon and Gotham. Gotham data tracking, you know what that does? That's making sure that every time you turn your phone on when you get off the plane, when you cross the state line, gives you a little tag that goes, hey, do you want a COVID alert in your neighborhood? You know why? Because you are being monitored. Your phone is being monitored. Your transactions are being monitored. Your credit cards are being monitored. Your health behavior is being monitored. Your vaccine status is being monitored. And it's all done under the contract run by Gotham Data Sciences, the company that went public during COVID. And none of you knew about this. And you've been to red pills. And you still haven't taken the red pill. And by the way, I'm not even to the good slide yet. So be depressed because it's getting worse. Publicist Sapient, the Health and Human Services IT contract. Have you ever wondered how the data never seems to add up, but always somebody always has allegedly the same reportable data? Publicist Sapient has the Health and Human Services IT contract to consolidate all of the data. So guess what happens? Everybody has the same number of COVID cases to report when somebody from the media calls and says, hey, how many cases do we have? Oh, 40,000. Round number, isn't it? 40,000. When in the course of human history has a round number involving the word thousand ever happened? Like there's 387 or there's 222 or there's 1,736. There's never been a 20,000 COVID day. There's never been a 20,000 cases of cancer day. There's never been a 10,000 heart day. There's never been a round number day until you actually control the Department of Health and Human Services entire IT platform. And not one of you knows that that's a single contract run by publicist statement. And you've been focused on the right-hand side this whole time and the left-hand side is doing the dirty work. Now, why do I call them privateers? How many are familiar with the difference between a pirate and a privateer? Pirates go rape and marauding and stealing and do all the piratey things and kind of look like me, swashbuckling, young, handsome, a little less Johnny Depp-ish than I could be, but you know, I'm sexier than Johnny Depp, so he's got something to shoot for. A pirate's that. A privateer is the same thing that has permission to do it by a government that's gone corrupt. That's what these are. They're the privateers. But hey, 
since we have privateers, it feels only appropriate that if we have a world of privateers, we should also have a world of the next slide. The next slide. The next slide, I'm pressing the button. We also have a world of pirates. And here's our pirates. Now, here's the fun thing. Pirates. UNC Chapel Hill, I talked about that. That's the guy who actually made the weapon, Ralph Barrick. Since 1999, has received over $100 million to weaponize the particles of coronavirus. Over $100 million. You've heard about $3.7 million going to Wuhan. Oh, $3.7 million. That feels like a bad number. And how about over $28 million of that coming from DARPA for their bioweapons initiative? Anybody hear about the $28 billion that went through Anthony Fauci and IID? Anybody hear about the $28 million that went directly to UNC Chapel Hill to weaponize the spike protein? You haven't heard about that. You haven't heard about that because... We've been talking about $3.7 million going to Wuhan. Stop being distracted by the cover story. If it's a reflex, don't fall for it. If it feels like something that is supposed to get your attention, stop giving it attention and going, what's the distraction for? Because the distraction is where the interesting thing is. UNC Chapel Hill, Vanderbilt, Emory, Johns Hopkins, and University of California, those are the pirates that have made the most money on federally granted disclosed money going into the university sector. I'm calling them pirates for a very good reason. They justify all this in the name of science and education. Kind of like Oppenheimer justified it working on this little thing called a, who would have thought it could be used as a bomb? I don't know. Let's go back, Oppenheimer, shall we? You drove into a facility that was guarded by military police. Hmm. Any hint? You just thought you were working on what? The power system for the greater New York metropolitan area? No, you were working on a bomb, you idiot. And if you're such a freaking savant, great nuclear physicist, put two and two together. Once you get to things like critical mass and detonation charges, would anything go off in your brain going, oh, maybe I'm working on a bomb, right? I don't even care whether these people pretend to hide behind me. It's an academic research project to try to get out of the bioweapons definition. The bioweapons definition says that if you enable a foreign entity to build something known to harm humanity, you have already created the felony. You are going to jail for the rest of your life and you are liable for a hundred million dollars penalty. So guess what? Welcome to hell, all five of these universities. Because they're all felons, all of them. And how about the right-hand side? MIT, New York University, Langone. Hey, by the way, Langone, where did that name come from? Ken Langone. Anybody? Ken Langone. Anybody? Oh, I'm not supposed to say that let name out loud, Ken Langone, except I just did, didn't I, Ken Langone? You read the name of a place, they're actually putting their name on the letterhead and you don't know who to look for. You still be, you're still being told, oh, it's the Rothschilds and it's the Rockefellers. and it's the... No, it's not. It's the guy who put his name on the facility. How many of you know who Ken Langone is? Guess what? Look it up, because that's a pretty big thing that you should be aware of. And unfortunately, you're not aware of it for a very good reason, because he hid it in plain sight on the name of the medical center, New York University Langone. Like, that's a really hard thing to find. Holy crap. DZIF, Shark. You've heard of Christian Drosten the crazy in chief in Germany, who's kind of Anthony Fauci and Ralph Barrick's, you know, evil stepchild. Imperial College, the criminal conspirators that actually came up with the fear porn of how many people were going to die. IHME, the University of Washington program. But the one that I want to bring your attention to is the one at the bottom, Erasmus. And it's not MCAM. That's an autocorrect function, unfortunately, in PowerPoint. That's the name of my company. So anybody who wants to go, ha, 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 you put your name on there. Yes, I did. But that's because PowerPoint autocorrected MC, Medical Center, and put my name on there because I'm boring when it comes to typing the name of my company. And I autocorrect with MC. Erasmus Medical Center. Bart Hagman's. Bart Hagman's. Now, I'm going to run out of time, but I'm not going to give myself enough time. So let's just go down the pathway for a very brief moment. In 2002, Bart Hagman's was an interesting dude because he figured out how to actually build a bunch of patents around the vaccines for coronavirus. Mysteriously, the European Union in 2012 started giving him massive, massive grants 
to run a thing called Zappi, Z-A-P-I. And Zappi was the Zoonotic um, Disease Transmission Laboratory for the European Union. And BART seemed to always get the money. Now, this is fascinating because BART was also the one who decided to patent MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Remember that one? The one that never really happened, but kind of happened 12, 2012, 2013. BART was the one that patented MERS. And it's funny, and I did a show on this, so you can look it up on Kim and My Butterfly of the Week. I did a show last week on this. But what's funny about this one is that the medical center, Erasmus Medical Center, actually in the public statement, when they were confronted with the lie where they said that they hadn't filed a patent on the actual genome, kind of like CDC said back in 2007, when they were confronted with the lie, they said in public, and you can't make this shit up, people. It's so funny. They said, well, what we said was not entirely false in all jurisdictions in the world. I wish I knew that when I was six. Did you eat the cookie? Well, when you say eat, are we using the Rwandan definition of eat that was codified in 1817? Because if you mean eat as in I grew it and I made it and I cooked it and I, then no, I didn't. I would have loved to have had that definition when I was 16. I would have loved to have it when I was 22. I'd love to have it now at 54. I'd love to be able to go, well, what I said was true if I'm using the 1817 definition of the words that I just lied to you about. Well, that's what they actually did. Go look at that video. It's actually quite funny. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is the slide you wanted to see. This is actually the names and faces of the people who are, in fact, killing humanity. And that's all of them. Now, here's the bad news. There's a lot of people on that slide, aren't there? Here's the better news. If Ed smiles nice and does something nice, I don't know, something nice, I'll actually give you all this slide because why not? Let's make sure that we don't ever forget the names and the faces of the people who've decided to kill us. And I'm going to not get everybody named because I have a few minutes left but I want you to have some looks on there, and some of them are kind of interesting, like celloist Yo-Yo Ma. Did you hear me say that? Cellist Yo-Yo Ma. How about the head of the Wellcome Trust? Not surprising there, right? How about Princess Rania of Jordan? Ooh, that's weird. How about the woman who happens to be sitting at the helm of the leadership of the government of Canada, but conveniently out of sight, but running 100% of the money for the government of Canada. Cheryl, how about all of these interesting people like, you know, Jim Muggins of Strava? How about uh, uh, Zhu Min, chairman of the National Institute of Financial Research in China? How about all of these individuals? And what makes these individuals interesting is that when you look at them, you find out something very important. Almost none of them almost none of them have sought any public visibility. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny? Which makes me pick on one of them. The guy I have down here in the bottom corner. And I have to give him credit because he has done so much to stay out of sight. So I feel like I've got 12 minutes and 22 seconds left. I need to spend a couple minutes on the guy who's paid every search engine optimization to keep his name out of search engines. And I'm doing that so that it costs him a shitload to keep all of you silent. So let's get really clear on Dustin Moskowitz. Shall we? Dustin Moskowitz. Guess what? We just cost him a shitload of money. I just said his name. And his name's on the internet, which means he's paying right now to try to shut me up. So let me say it again. Dustin Moskowitz. Dustin Moskowitz. Dustin Moskowitz. I just blew through about $12 million of trying to have him suppress my voice right now. And let's do it one more time. Dustin Moskowitz. Hell, let's do it together. Dustin Moskowitz, you little piece of shit. Let's talk about him for a minute. The co-founder of Facebook that you've never heard of. Oh, oh, things got really weird really fast, didn't it? Dustin Moskowitz, the co-founder of Facebook, also the guy who funded Open Philanthropy, who was the actual check writer for Event 201. You were told that it was the the World Economic Forum. You were told that it was Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You were told it was Johns Hopkins University. But the actual check that cleared for the program was signed by none other than Dustin Moskowitz. 
There, another couple million dollars just went out of his pocket. Shit, I hate doing this. It's like I have stutter. It's, I think, Tourette's. I think it's Tourette's. Dustin Moskowitz. Dustin Moskowitz. Oh, man. <laughs> hate doing that. Because every time I say his name, he has to pay to suppress my voice. Dustin Moskowitz. Now, I'm picking on him for a good reason. He's a felon. He's a criminal. He is one of the most sociopathic, psychopathic, crazy people who's walking this planet. And he's paid to keep his name in private. So guess what? Don't let him. The reason why I'm going to give you this slide is because I want every one of these people named. I want them all publicly named. Because it's time that we start going through the reality of saying that we, the people, are not going to let mass murderers get away anonymous, anonymously mass murdering people. We are not going to allow that to happen. Not on our watch. And that's why you have this slide. And I don't want you ever to go, oh, well, but oh, she at least dresses nice at balls. I don't give a shit if she dresses nice at balls. If she's a mass murderer, her name needs to be on the mass murderer list, not on the best dress list at a ball. You know why? Because mass murdering is more important than best dressed on a ball. That's why. That's the reason why. But let's go back to Dustin. Isn't it interesting that Dustin conveniently decided to shroud this entire public health crisis in a self-serving, self-interested investment objective? He owns Sherlock Biosciences. Sherlock, Sherlock Biosciences happens to be the company that owns the CRISPR technology that is the joint venture between the United States and China on gene editing the human genome. Did you hear what I just said? Gene editing the human genome. Anybody feeling good about this? Let's get a little more uncomfortable, shall we? Dustin Moskowitz knew that if he actually tried to take this technology into the public, nobody would be willing to do it, particularly given the fact that it's a JV between him and the government of China. That's the reason why we'd have a problem with it. Because it feels like eugenics. You know why it feels like eugenics? Because it is eugenics. That's why it feels like it. That's why it feels like it. That's why it feels like Cold Spring Harbor Labs. Can we mention Cold Spring Harbor Labs one time just together? Just to screw them too because they pay to be quiet. Cold Spring Harbor Labs. Thank you. That costs them a lot. Let's keep doing this because what happens is that what we have is a technology that uses gene editing. And the only way we could get gene editing technology approved was with emergency use authorization. Not surprisingly, once everybody was distracted on vaccines and everybody was distracted on RT-PCR and everybody was distracted on everything else, Sherlock Biosciences slipped their emergency use authorization application into the FDA and got it. In other words, using the cover of COVID, which all of us are pretending to talk about, the editing of the human genome was approved and not one of us said a thing. Now, if you were going to edit the human genome, do you think you'd need a good cover story to actually hide what you're really doing? And you know who you'd do? You'd probably find the guy who actually has the biggest financial interest in doing it and make sure that while everybody's looking over at coronavirus and COVID and trying to figure out whether there's lab leak hypothesis, there's no lab leak hypothesis because there is no lab leak. So stop talking about lab leaks. There is no lab leak. This is a willful weaponization of the spike protein. That's what it is. It's an act of war. It's not a leak. We need to start calling it what it is. It's an act of war. It's an act of war against humanity. We stop pretending to take their bait and follow their stupid rabbit trails and go down stupid rabbit trails into stupid rabbit holes and wonder why there's a bunch of pee and piss and poo that smells like rabbit warrens. Well, it smells like it because that's what you find at the end of a rabbit trail. We need to be focused on the point, and the point is, People like Dustin Moskowitz. And once again, this slide, and I've left it up a long time, this slide is going to be shared with everybody in this room because it is incumbent on you. Now you know. Now you must act. Because when we talk about the they, we empower the they. But when we talk about the names of people, we humanize this sociopathic behavior. We humanize the fact that there are individuals and organizations that are willfully murdering and harming the humanity that we know and love. And we cannot let that happen on our watch. It is incumbent on all of us to get those words out. The conspiring states. You'll notice a very interesting thing I did on this graph. And by the way, this is the coolest graph I've ever come up with. 
because that's just badass. If you actually overlay the map of the world, you'll realize that I geolocated every one of my flags exactly where it belongs on the map. So you are welcome. I spent way too much time on this slide. And because of that, if you're picking one slide to take my amazing picture with, this is the slide. Thank you very much. That's the amazing picture. And so, but the most important piece of this slide is what I put in the Atlantic Ocean. Because the real nation state isn't a nation state. Listen, the real nation state is not a nation state. The Treaty of Westphalia, the stupid idea of drawing lines on maps and calling them countries, has long been dead. The real control is that, what I call the Atlantic Coalition of Doom. The Atlantic Coalition of Doom, BlackRock, AXA, the International Monetary Fund, HSBC, ICBC, and, you guessed it, United Healthcare. But Dave, you're picking on people who help take care of people. Um, no, I'm not. United Healthcare is a corrupt organization. It is a corrupt organization must be called what it is. It is actually the most manipulative corporate structure known to humanity because what it does is it matches life insurance and insurance products with the delivery of health care so they can do what? Manage your health? Oh, ho, 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 no. Bet against the timing of your death. That's the internal arbitrage. It is the wet dream of the Lloyds of London Syndicate. They would have loved to have had this opportunity. But guess what? They didn't. United Healthcare did. They put two things together, which is they get to manage your life so they can time your death, so they can profit on both. How many of you feel good about that? And by the way, how many people expected me to mention United Healthcare as one of the co conspirators here? Not one person, and that's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm running out of time, but the good news is I still have time. Not much. The criminal conspiracies, you have this, and if you want to go online to activatehumanity.com, this is available in um, a, a essay I wrote for attorneys general filing. So if you want to file this with an attorney general, you can actually use that. The other place you can go is you can actually make sure that you download this on all of my social media because I have it on all my social media so that you can actually access this thing. I'm going to jump over this. I'm going to jump over this. I'm only going to call these intolerable acts. And once again, all these presentations you're going to have, so don't worry about me jumping past the slides because I'm watching the time. All the intolerable acts are exactly what they are. They are intolerable acts because when we started this country, there were four intolerable acts, primarily centered around the blockade of the, the harbor of Boston. And that was the thing that really pissed us off, right? We were sick and tired of King George doing a lot of things. But when he blocked commerce and trade, we were like, that's enough, okay? And we had four intolerable acts. One of them was being able to march into your house and take quarter in your house if you were a soldier and all that kind of stuff. We didn't like that either. But the big one was the economic blockade, which leads me to this. What's the cure? The cure is we the people have failed. And by that, I mean we, the people, and I'm putting me in the middle of it. We actually made the mistake of thinking that somehow or another, by being pissed off at something, that justified us taking an action. And here's the tiny problem. When you justify your action by being pissed off at something, you're giving the thing power. Okay? We, the people, need to actually take responsibility for us, the people, now. Not wait for some permission, not wait for some egregious act, not wait for something else. We, the people, actually need to do something. And what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you quickly through these, and I'm going to end with the best punchline ever. Rather than actually reciting things that say we're pissed off at the world, we need to actually say what it means to be human. So, for example, by nature, we are provisioned for life, liberty, livelihood unrestricted from provisioning, meaning that we have the access to do and engage with a world that is abundant and generative and full of life and full of life aligned for life. That's what we are. Number two, we are at liberty to peacefully assemble, speak, disagree, express, believe and choose. We are at liberty to be interactive beings. That's what we are. Not getting permission from this. People, these are not rights. They cannot be granted this is the essential nature of the human condition. And the minute we actually say we have the right to it, we've already subordinated ourselves. So stop subordinating yourself and take your inalienable condition and claim it as your own. Number three, freedom of inquiry with assurance of veracity 
and provenance. What does that mean? That means we're not free to speak a lie. Did you hear what I said? We're not free to speak a lie. We're not free to recite propaganda. In fact, we're explicitly prohibited from doing that. My word better be true. Your word better be true. And does that mean that it contained all truth? No, but it better be my true statement and your true statement. Because if you're reciting something, if you're a ventriloquist for somebody else's initiative, you violated an essential nature of what it means to be human. You do not speak for, you speak. And your speech is true, and it comes from you. And if it doesn't, you don't say it. How about that? There's an interesting way to go. We're at liberty to exchange value and economics and commerce with transparency. In other words, we don't have to go through a taxable system. We don't have to go through a fiat system. We have to go through a system where we account for all the inputs and all the outputs, and we agree. When we sit together, we agree that value is represented and has been transferred. We do not need a fiat. We do not need a blockchain. We do not need an intermediary. We need to engage in the exchange of value, and we need to put that in our founding documents so that we never lose the ability to engage in free and open commerce, ever, for any reason. We should be afforded access to the derivatives of all public goods, meaning if we paid for it as a society, we should be able to benefit from it without restriction, meaning that the airwaves, the bandwidth, the fiber, the FCC communications, whatever it is, if we paid for it as a public, we own it as a public, and that means we use it as a public. And last but not least, we are organically undefiled from birth to death. Now, many of you think that I mean injections or ingestion. That's not what I mean. I mean those two things, but I mean the third and more important and most important of all. We have the right to make sure that what goes into our ears does not defile us. We have the right to make sure that we are exposed to frequencies of truth, integrity, harmony with life, harmony with the universe, harmony with the ability to be human. And we are entitled to that by virtue of our existence. I have my time's up thing, but I have one last thing to say. I promised I'd do something. This is my last moment of doing these drive-by shooting exercises. We're going to do something. And Stan, who's going to come on stage right after me, and John, and a bunch of the team out in Utah, and a bunch of people around the country are working together on this. We are actually going to move something forward, and you're going to hear about it over the next couple of days. So stay tuned on Activate Humanity. Stay tuned on our new site, Kim and my brand new site that just came out, the FullyLiveAcademy.com. So Fully Live Academy, all one word, FullyLiveAcademy.com, done in part by Amanda Jackson sitting right here. Um, and we're going to be putting this information up on there. But what's going to happen is we are going to actively take on the structures that I just showed you. And what we're going to do, and I want to be really clear on what we're doing. What we're going to do is we're going to create a blockchain NFT platform, which is going to take all of the evidence of all the crimes that have been done by every one of these perpetrators. All that evidence is going to be consolidated. And what we're going to do is we're going to be releasing that. We're going to release it. I don't know how many of you are familiar with what happened with GameStop. Anybody? Just think that, only maybe put it in the context of some of the things you saw in these slides. Only a lot bigger. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a community that actually allows every individual to take action to make sure that these organizations and institutions are held accountable financially for the things that they've done. And we're going to use the proceeds of that listen carefully, to make sure we fulfill the social contract that we the people have failed. Because the social contract is this. There are tons of men and women, children around this country, tons of them, who have actually been injured by the pathologies that you've seen talked about. And what we are going to do is we're going to use the proceeds of the transactions that we actually do to make sure that we the people are accountable to the families of vaccine-injured children. This is about making abundantly clear, ladies and gentlemen, abundantly clear that if we the people are going to say that we want to form a more perfect union, it is incumbent on us to start acting like it. 
This is not about declaring independence. This is about declaring our international inextricable interdependence and accountability that says that in our name, harm has been done. And in our name, we are going to reconcile that harm with a better humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned on that. We're going to be going live very shortly. And it is an honor to be here. Thank you for this moment. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Red Pill. And I look forward to talking to you. Yeah.